Right. Me and this guy's playing tag back here. So anyway, he takes great care of me on the speaker button, but I mess him up. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. It is right at 7 o'clock, and we are going to uh, convene the Planning and Zoning Commission this evening. If you would, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission may choose to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Thank you. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Thank you. Let's move to consent. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items, items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners or staff. Thank you. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda as submitted. So I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Tong to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Uh, Mr. Ali is not here. One, two, three. Okay, we have an error on our voting, so we'll have to get this straight. Mr. Lyle is here, not Mr. Ali. So we need to... Tell you what, while she's uh, doing that, let's just do a quick hand vote. So that item carries six to zero. So we'll let her get that straightened up and we'll move to item one. <clears throat> My apologies. There we go. Items for individual consideration, public hearing items. Unless instructed otherwise by the chair, speakers will be called in the order registrations are received. Applicants are limited to a total of 15 minutes of presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Administrative consideration items must be approved if they meet city development regulations. Legislative consideration items are more discretionary except as constrained by legal considerations. Agenda item one, public hearing, zoning case 2023-006. This is a request for specific use permits for a private club and food truck park on one, I'm sorry, on 0.8 acre located 524 feet north of Park Boulevard and 940 feet east of Preston Road. This was tabled on September 5th, 2023. Petitioner is Amrit SSPF Preston Gold LP. This is for legislative consideration. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katja Copeland, and I'm the senior planner with the planning <clears throat> department. The applicants have requested to table this request to the October 2nd planning and zoning commission meeting, and staff supports that request. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on item one? On item one? Right, thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on item one? No, we do not. Thank you. I will close the public hearing and find discussion of the commission. Uh, I make a motion. We move zone. We we table zoning case number 2023-006 to the October 2nd, 2023 meeting. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Ratliff with a second by Commissioner Bronski to accept the applicant's request to table. Please vote. And that item carries six to zero. Item two. And you can read A and B together.
Agenda item number two and two B, public hearing, zoning case 2023-013, request to rezone 7.9 acres located at the southeast corner of Municipal Avenue and 13th Street from Light Industrial One to plan development downtown business government to allow outdoor commercial amusement as an additional use and to modify development standards including, but not limited to, setback, height, parking. Tabled on September 15th, 2023. Petitioner is 2022 Plano Luna LP. This is for legislative consideration. Public hearing item 2B is a concept plan, rail side edition, block A, lots one and two, 390 multifamily residence units on lot one, restaurant and outdoor commercial amusement on lot two, on 6.7 acres located at the southeast corner of Municipal Avenue and 13th Street. Zoned light industrial one. Again, applicant is 2022 Plano Luna LP. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening again. This request is to change the zoning <coughs> from light industrial one to planned development downtown business government to allow for outdoor commercial amusement with multifamily residents and commercial uses in a pedestrian-oriented context. Highlighted on the screen in yellow is the property. Across 13th Street, the properties are zoned retail and are developed with single-family residences, vehicle storage, and vacant property. Across N Avenue, is the property is zoned retail and light industrial one and is developed with commercial antenna support structure, utility distribution line, and a DART railroad right-of-way. Immediately south of the subject property is DART right-of-way, and across the DART is Light Industrial One. Across Municipal Avenue, the properties are zoned light, commercial, with specific use permits number 166 for Transit Center Station and number 406 contract construction and are developed with service contractors, professional general administrative offices, and a transit center station. On the screen is the companion concept plan. The applicant is proposing 390 unit multifamily building with small pockets of active open space and a parking garage on the western side of the property. On the eastern side, a restaurant and patio are proposed in addition to outdoor commercial amusement and a surface parking lot. The large existing warehouse building along the DART Railroad right-of-way is proposed to be preserved and reused as the outdoor commercial amusement space. There will also be on-street parking along 13th Street and proposed private shared street. This is a colored concept plan as provided by the applicant. The subject property is designated downtown corridors on the future land use map. The request does not conform to the mix of uses RGM5A, RGM5B within the DT dashboard and findings are required to recommend approval for this item. This property is uniquely situated between streets and transit right of way and is surrounded by existing development. The proposed 12th Street Silver Line station is under construction and there is an opportunity for this property to become a transit oriented development. Shown on the screen is the initial concept plan and the current concept layout. The major changes when doing a side-by-side -side comparison is the increase in residential, reduction in non-residential, and the internal street alignment in, as the initial concept layout connected to NM Avenue. This property is ripe for redevelopment and the Planning and Zoning Commission should consider the appropriate development standards that would best support the long-range goal for this area to the city. Uh, can we please move the slide forward one? Thank you. The applicant is requesting to allow 390 units within the subject property, <coughs> exceeding the typical block length by 30% within the BG zoning district. The BG district allows four stories of multifamily by right, or four stories of multifamily may be constructed constructed on a horizontal structure concrete podium where the first floor consists of non-residential uses, flex space, or parking. Adjacent to 13th Street, 
To respect the existing one-story single-family residences, the applicant is proposing to restrict the building heights to a maximum of four stories and 55 feet, with a maximum of 35-foot setback. For the remainder of Lot 1, the applicant is proposing five stories and 65 feet, with a setback between 15 and 20 feet from Municipal Avenue. The applicant proposes a PD uh, stipulation that would delay development of multifamily until the earlier of January 1, 2025, or after issuing a building permit to construct or repurpose 5,000 square feet of non-residential space. This stipulation does not provide any firm commitment to commercial uses. Staff is supportive of the PD stipulations, noting the building facades may not exceed 150 feet in length without an insert, insert vertical break of at least three feet. 80% of the residential units may have a true balcony or patio, and private open space is required at a rate of 50 square feet per unit and will be provided in the interior courtyards. The applicant is proposing to add pickleball courts to the existing warehouse building, noting the operational and location restrictions within the PD provides clarity on what types of outdoor commercial amusement uses will be allowed, as there are single-family residents across 13th Street. However, staff is concerned that this request is not following the purpose of a planned development as noted in Article 12 of the Zoning Ordinance. And as previously mentioned, the applicant is proposing that vertical residential construction may not occur until the earlier of January 1, 2025, or after the issuance of a building permit for the construction or repurposing of 5,000 square feet of non-residential space. To meet the purpose of a planned development, commitments or restrictions are necessary to commit fulfilling a balanced mix of uses on the property. A mix of uses is also important to the comprehensive plan. Staff does not support the proposed timing of construction standard. The commitment to non-residential uses is absent with just 5,000 square feet of non-residential space out of the total square footage exceeding 28,000. The proposed multifamily use could be accommodated with some site modifications with straight BG zoning instead of a planned development. Shown on the screen, is the purpose of a plan development, which is located in Article 12 of the Zoning Ordinance. On this slide and the next two slides are the plan development stipulations provided by the applicant. We received eight unique in favor responses within the 200 foot buffer. And we received 47 unique responses, 43 in support and four in opposition. We received two duplicates and two responses outside of the city of Plano. And after the cutoff time, we did receive one additional online response that was in favor. To summarize, the applicant is requesting to rezone the subject property from light industrial one to plan development downtown business government to allow for outdoor commercial amusement with multifamily residents and commercial uses in a pedestrian-oriented context. This property is ripe for redevelopment. However, the request is disfavored because the prop proposal lacks conformity with key comprehensive plan policies. There are opportunities to reduce and adjust the multifamily development and propose, a more, propose more commitments to commercial uses, which would better support the goals of the comprehensive plan and align with other developments in downtown Plano. Staff does not see a viable need to have a planned development for the subject property where typical BG zoning could be accommodated. For these reasons, and without necessary changes, this request, uh, staff recommends denial. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So I see several things popping up here. Uh, I have one, but my guess is one of them is going to ask the same question anyway. So we'll go first with Mr. Bruno. Go ahead. Oops. And let's let's keep in mind these are technical questions for staff. Mm -hmm. um, we're not asking for their opinion. We'll wait until the developer speaks. So let's just stay focused. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you said that 
some adjustments could be made with a straight BG zoning, specifically what adjustments would a straight BG zoning support? The applicant's proposing 390 units and BG limits nine, uh, 300. So that would be at least one slight modification. Any others? Mr. Hill, can you help? Yeah. Yeah, the other issue is the construction of the building. There's a required podium construction for five-story uh, buildings in the BG district, and the applicant's requesting to um, not provide that type of construction. Would the BG district support the, um, the outdoor uh, uh, amusement? No, they, they do need zoning for the outdoor commercial amusement use as well. I'm sorry? No, they, they do need zoning for the outdoor commercial amusement as well. Okay, so let me see if I understand. The staff's major issues would be the number of units, the commitment to build the non-residential, um, and the horizontal podium. Is that correct? The horizontal podium. There's a fourth issue with the, the layout of the street, that the layout that's proposed by the applicant is not what was recommended by the city. Oh, you mean it has to, it, it, the staff is recommending the street be opposite the, the street as it continues across 13th Street? That's correct, to connect with M Avenue. Yes, yes. M Avenue. So th that's correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bronski. Uh, one question. On um, page nine of your report, where it talks about uh, block pattern and streetscape, you mentioned that it meets, but then on page 16, uh, you go into detail talking about that uh, the recommendation from the city, uh, although the current design is functional, it's not in alignment with the city's recommendation. Uh, should that have been, is that still meets for the block pattern? It does not meet. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hill. Yeah, I'm trying to find the specific page references. Nine. Page nine under which heading? Uh, have... Future land use, uh, desirable character defining elements, block pattern and streetscape meets. Yes, so there's, um, I think there's a policy recommendation in the comprehensive plan about the uh, general layout of blocks and street pattern in the downtown district, and it meets that recommendation of a policy. And then let me look at the other reference that you're discussing, which is on page 16, I believe you said? Yes. <clears throat> Under the... Internal street. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the internal street alignment shifted east. Initially, the street was aligned. Correct. That's why I was curious if it right. should have so, been... So there's a policy... Meet. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. There's a policy recommendation in the conference of plan, but then there's also a recommended layout for the design of the street. So those were two different analyses. They did meet the conference of plan recommendation, but the transportation recommendation uh, was not what was supported by staff. Okay, yeah, that, I, I just needed some clarity on that. Thank you. Good question so far. I already took care of one of mine. Uh, Commissioner Tom. Thank you. Um, I One quick question regarding timing. Um, and there's a description saying this property is ripe for the re redevelopment, uniquely situated between streets and agents to the DART um, 12-3 zero line station. So what's the timing on the DART zero line station and the zero line operation? Do you have an estimate on those projects <coughs> to be done? Sure, I'm actually gonna ask Ms. Pilati if she has um, an idea of when the silver line may be open. Currently, um, two of these stations are, um, th the plans are um, approved and um, the construction permits will be released. And then um, there is another station that staff is working with the applicant. Um, the plan is to have that line operational by the end of 2025. Operational by the end of 2025? 2025. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Ratliff. Yeah, just one question. On if it was if if we did BG straight zoning, one of the questions are being answered, the recreate the the um, game lawn or whatever wouldn't be allowed use. But would that not also open up lot two 
to other uses that are used by right in BG? Absolutely. Similar land uses could be health and fitness center. <coughs> we allow tennis, racquetball, handball. Also, um, in, um, indoor commercial amusement allows for bingo, bowling, and a skating rink. So not totally pickleball, but at least some sort of entertainment act activity where there could be a fee for food and beverage and um, a sporting activity. But I guess my question is without the, B, without the PD, if it went straight zoning, they could also come back and build more apartments there, couldn't they? They could, but um, as Mr. Hill noted, there are limitations as far as units, block length, um, podium, parking. So they would be maxed out at this property at 300 units. Even if it's two separate lots? If it's two separate lots, I think they could build if, more. If it's subdivided by a street, they could have uh, individual multifamily developments on each block. That's correct. Now, I do want to note, you know, staff is supportive of the outdoor commercial amusement proposal. Yeah. However, there's just no firm commitment to that in their standards. They would need a PD or SUP to accomplish that. So if, if a commitment was offered and associated with this request, we'd be supportive of it. As we see it, the, the ask is really for a large multifamily building and the opportunity to do outdoor commercial amusement, but not the commitment to do it. I was just trying to evaluate the pros and cons of straight zoning versus PD is what I was trying to figure out. So, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for staff? All right, thank you very much. We will open the public hearing and I'm assuming the applicant has a presentation for us. We do. First, we have Pierce Cravens. Uh, then if I can have uh, Matt Carter, Sean Luther and William Cravens take a seat. Uh, behind the podium. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Pierce Cravens, and my wife and I reside at 20, uh, 1028 17th Street in downtown Plano. I'm also the general partner of 2022 Plano Luna, the applicant and property owner for this evening's presentation. We support and seek to leverage the city's goals to promote walkable developments that are transit-oriented in nature, given the city's investiture in the Silver Line Station on 12th Street, which, as you know, is currently under construction. Now let's talk about the team a little bit. Um, Metropolitan Interest Corporation is our family's real estate company that has been developing and investing in Plano for more than 50 years. We've developed over 3,000 single-family subdivision lots, large-scale office projects, and several industrial parks and apartment complexes in Plano. 20 years ago, we became interested in investing and developing in downtown specifically after we acquired the building that eventually became the Fillmore Pub. We continued to acquire buildings and properties in downtown throughout the years, and the development of the Silver Line has further encouraged our investment appetite. We recently completed at 15th Street, which is a 52-unit apartment complex on 15th and Municipal, and a boutique townhome community on 17th between J and K Avenue. We're currently constructing another project on 10th Street as well. Suffice to say, we've been long-term local owners in downtown Plano, and we have no interest in having it any other way. We purchased the subject site last August, and after a long vetting process, we were fortunate enough to bring these two partners that are with us this evening to the table who are ready to go. With us this evening is Sean Luther, who will describe a little bit about uh, Heinz Corporation. Sean? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Luther, and I'm here today representing Heinz, the developer for the project. Um, some quick background on who we are. Heinz was founded in 1957 and is one of the largest privately owned real estate firms in the world. Uh, we were founded in Houston by the late Gerald Heinz, who started developing industrial and office exclusively in Houston. And since then, we've grown to be in 32 countries around the world, touching all product types. So here in the Metroplex, um, we are involved in over 20 active projects ranging in all product types from industrial, self-storage, master plan communities, office, multifamily, and mixed use. We're excited to be here presenting on this project and to be partnering with these folks. Um, what really got us excited about this site were, were two things. 
the fact that it's located in downtown Plano and the walkable, vibrant environment that that is, we always look for opportunities to develop in places that have an element of history and, and a true cool factor, which we think downtown does. Um, and secondly, we are very excited about the involvement of the Bolden Acres folks and the fact that they are here as an owner um, looking to, to be a long-term owner, not just a tenant. So I'll turn it over to Matt with Bolden Acres who will introduce himself. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity to come up to Plano. Uh, we opened our first Bolden Acres one month before the pandemic hit. And uh, we were lucky enough to survive that downtime. Um, and it kind of molded our project into what it's become today. Um, I had my first child right before, or right after we opened, uh, right before we shut down. And I kind of saw this as a huge outdoor space where we could bring families together, young professionals, um, people that wanted to watch sports and kind of put this whole thing together and we're lucky that it morphed into what it did. Uh, we cater to the community more than anything um, because I live in that community and that's how we were able to do so. Uh, we work with all the local schools um, doing fundraisers. We also uh, host fundraisers as well for political candidates and stuff like that, um, kind of on our own, not so much supporting or not. Uh, but it's just a big place where everyone kind of comes together. Um, I can't really describe it other than a community. Uh, we instill that in our staff, quality food, quality beverage, quality service, um, above all. And in doing so, we kind of bring everyone together in doing so. Um, we're really excited about this project, which is why we're looking to buy the property, not just lease the property. Um, we, we, designed the original one based on a historic neighborhood in Austin called Bolden Creek, which is where the name came from. And this is the exact market that we're looking to come into. Um, strong community values, very walkable uh, bike path nearby. The majority of our clientele uh, walks because they like to bring their dogs or they push a stroller with their kids. Um, both are not that easy to drive. Uh, a lot of people bike. We have huge bike parking areas. Uh, we'll be right on that new hike and bike trail. Uh, we're looking forward to the Silver Line being right nearby. Um, and so that's yeah, basically it. We're pretty excited about it. I don't really know what else to say. Thanks, man. <laughs> Hopefully you can answer any other questions. <laughs> so our vision, as Matt and Sean were saying, is to create a southern gateway to downtown through quality design based on transit-oriented principles. We seek to combine a housing and destination restaurant and leisure use, which I, as a downtown resident, feel is lacking. We're trying to fulfill the city's vision to provide a development that promotes walkability and connects the rest of downtown with the 12th Street Station. And we seek to partner with Plano's artists to provide murals within our site that give a nod to downtown's history. Now, the city has done an excellent job with respect to curating events and making downtown a destination. However, Outside of these events, there are few activities and businesses that keep people here for longer than a meal or a quick trip to a shop, whereas Bolden Acres and Pickleball more broadly has a market radius that extends 20 miles. It's a family-friendly commercial use that you can spend the entire day. Um, and a lot of business owners here tell me that they need more people in downtown to support the businesses that are currently here. And I think if there's anything that supports that fact is the vacant retail that's along 14th Street. This is a catalyst development, in our opinion, that this area needs to thrive and spur additional investment and patronage in adjacent properties and businesses. As staff mentioned, our site is located directly across the Silver Line Station. We parallel the Dart Track to the south, 13th Street to the north, Municipal Avenue to the west, and N Avenue to the east. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting this to advance. Play no TV, please advance the slide. So there's the site. And if I could uh, ask you to go to the next slide, please. So why this site? 
In 2022, the AECOM study that the City Commission detailed properties that are, were, were of high redevelopment potential around the 12th Street and Shiloh Street stations. In that study, only one property had a gold star with the descriptor of a catalyst site. As you can see, this is the largest site in the area. Its location is fantastic in terms of its proximity and accessibility. And large parcels are very difficult to aggregate downtown. For example, this one took nearly three years to put together. Because of the size and significance of this development, we feel it'll stimulate further investment and aggregation in the property. The current use of the property is very different from what we envision. The current use encompasses heavy commercial and building material storage. We have a multitude of short and midterm tenants, and it's presently in a blighted state, as you can see. Despite its appearance, however, and being underutilized, it is an economically performing property. But we feel it does nothing to complement the DART station or downtown. And further, other uses that are allowable by right with our current zoning, such as multi-warehouse, likewise do nothing to complement downtown. With its industrial zoning, we feel that it's a use that has outlived its location. And Sean will come up, if we could go to the next slide, please, thank you, to describe our site plan. Thanks, Pierce. So the site plan is thoughtfully designed to provide a destination restaurant experience for Plano residents while also creating a high quality housing option to meet the ongoing demands of a growing downtown. Given our proximity to the Dart Line and the future 12th Street Station, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to orient this site in order to fulfill the city's vision for this as a gateway and a catalyst site. So the east portion of the site, if you're looking at the plan, will include roughly two and a half acres dedicated to the new pickleball restaurant concept that you've heard about tonight, including the preservation of the existing 22,000 square foot warehouse, which was historically used as an agricultural processing facility. The old warehouse will house six indoor pickleball courts in addition to a newly constructed 6,000 square foot restaurant where Bolden Acres will serve food and drinks. An outdoor game lawn between the buildings will be utilized for leisure, various games and activities. Moving to the west portion of the site, we designed a multifamily project with an adjacent structured parking garage and there's a couple key items that I wanna point out for everyone. So, Number one, the garage is oriented parallel to the dart track. This is done very intentionally to minimize the exposure of the rail line and enhance the experience for the residents. The leasing office, the amenities, and the main entrance to the multifamily are on the bottom left of that plan if you're viewing it. And they're oriented south on municipal, which is done to minimize the number of units that face the dart track, while also providing the quickest and the most convenient route for DART riders to get to and from their residences. The project will also include a wide range of unit sizes from approximately 500 square feet to around 1,300 square feet. This is done intentionally to appeal to a wider range of income levels and age levels. We also designed flex units at the ground level of all perimeter facing units on Municipal and 13th Street, which allows for an activated streetscape and the potential for future commercial space at the ground level should it be demanded. Finally, when we talk about the space between the uses, we wanted to design a very pedestrian friendly, curbless, walkable street that would promote pedestrian use and invite people from the DART station to move freely through the site. So what we've done is designed a curbless street um, very similar to what you'd see at Eastside Village 1 or 2. And we think that this creates a nice environment that is porous and invites people, like I said, to move through the site um, and is very pedestrian fr friendly. So all these things were done um, to create a site that we think will be very attractive for the residents of Plano and from abroad. So on this slide here, we've got some imagery from existing locations of Bolden Acres. As you can see, you know, public facing art is very important to their concept. We believe that's important to the city of, of Plano and to downtown specifically. Um, our goal really is to have this site seamlessly blend in with downtown, right? We are intending to put a product on the ground that, that blends with the downtown character that has nodes to history, that's 
heavily um, incorporated with brick and, and really fits within the context and the character of downtown. Sir, you have two and a half minutes left of presentation time. Perfect, thank you. So moving on here, these are, we've produced two renderings um, with the architect team that we have on board. So really quickly, I'll touch on these. So the first rendering is an image at dusk. This is from the pedestrian scale. Viewer is looking south on 13th Street into Bolden Acres. You can see the existing warehouse building on the left side of this frame, the new restaurant right in the front, and then the multifamily building um, just behind it on the top right. As you can see, we focused on developing a very people-focused project, and that all starts at the ground plane and how we thought about the ground plane. We want it to be family-friendly, pet-friendly, be a place where the residents of Plano can spend multiple hours and linger, like Pierce alluded to. Um, the second rendering here is a daytime shot. So now you're looking north on Municipal. As you can see, this really focuses on this project being transit-oriented. You have the dart line passing on the right side, um, you have the hike and bike trails at the bottom right of the image, which will go south um, across the dart line and then cut up through municipal. We want to be very integrated with that. You also have a dog park um, in the foreground of this image, which is on the bottom left of the site plan. So as you can see, we're really trying to think about how to integrate with the hike and bike trails, how to make this a, a transit-oriented development that, that can really act as a catalyst um, for the city of Plano and for downtown specifically. Really quick on community outreach, Pierce, do you want to touch yeah, on that? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we have reached out to uh, stakeholders, businesses, property owners, HOAs in the surrounding area and have received overwhelming support. Uh, we've been engaged with the 12th Street Station area study, the Silver Line Charette, um, attended a regular HDPA meetings, which again, as you can see from the heat map, has garnered significant support. In summary, what we're trying to accomplish is not just another apartment complex and commercial use, but rather a destination use to serve as a catalyst for the neighborhood to spur greater development. We think this is a unique opportunity to attract people from a broader market radius who support not cannibalize businesses that are currently operating. And it's my hope and belief that people who visit Bolden Acres will visit other neighboring biz businesses and discover what a great place downtown Plano is. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah, right? Yes, we do. All right, so we're going to work our way through the speakers and then we'll come back to um, the applicant. If we have questions. If I can have uh, William Cravens was an applicant, but he, if you would like three minutes to speak uh, while let's, he let's makes his way the to the podium. So if we... I think if it's already applicants, we've kind of used their time. So okay. I would say let's look for people who aren't applicants to speak. Okay. Uh, next will be Nathan T. While he comes to the podium, I need David Bryant, Jackie Herna, and Kenneth Hyatt to sit behind the podium. I don't know how we got Nathan T., but it's Nathan Shea. Yeah. Um, that's okay. No problem. Um, Residence is 3106 Dublin Road. Uh, my Plano business is 1104 14th Street. I own and operate multiple businesses in downtown Plano. Um, all the urban family concepts are mine. Um, we finally moved over to 14th Street uh, about 12 years ago and then opened up Urban Seafood uh, about a year and a half ago. Our goal is to expand the downtown area from 15th to 14th all the way to where they're putting their development. I've known the Cravens for, gosh, since uh, we opened up Urban Crust and they opened up Fillmore Pub. Um, they are the kind of business, business people that we want in downtown. We need this density in downtown. The only way that downtown is gonna grow and prosper is to bring more people to the area. I know there's a lot of technical stuff involved here, but I will say that downtown needs a walkable, area where people can come, thrive, businesses can thrive, whether it's restaurants, retail, outdoor area. This thing is going to start. 12th Street can move all the way up to 14th Street and expand the entire downtown area. And I think that is what the city wants. And I hope you guys will approve this for these guys. They put a lot of time and effort into making this happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is David Bryant. 
Good evening. I'm uh, David Bryant with 1418 Coffee House in downtown Plano. Been there for 10 years, and uh, I couldn't be more excited about this project. For a variety of reasons, the word I hear when Pierce called me and began to tell me what they're going to do was, number one, people. People, more people come into our area, along with the Silver Line, having another destination that people will come in from other areas and have reason to come into a very unique opportunity. And I heard family. We don't hear a lot of that in downtown Plano. This will bring more a, a diversity into our community uh, that only helps us grow. Uh, as, as Nathan shared, as, as the town, as the downtown areas begin to expand, it's been a boon for all of us in downtown. And we've seen the, the work on 14th Street through the urban group. group. Our, my business has grown every year since because more people are coming in. So, of course, we hear more expansion, more, uh, more of a district now in downtown that goes even further. That just brings us more people. So uh, there's only one historic downtown. We can have all kinds of great uh, developments around our city, but there's only one historic downtown. And we want people to come there. The Silver Line gives that great opportunity. Uh, again, the Craven family, what they, their commitment to downtown. It's, it's unprecedented that these guys want to be in downtown. They want to see it grow and be a part of that. So we, we couldn't be more excited, and we thank these guys for bringing it our way, and we look forward to hearing you guys approve this and seeing us go forward. Thank you. Thank you. While Jackie Herna comes to the podium, <laughs> I need Kenneth Hyatt and Corey, Corey Reniker to come down. Hello, my name is Jackie Herna. I am the newer business owner of downtown Plano. I own Cocoa Beach on 15th and K. I do own a business in Richardson, and so I've worked on cross-promoting to bring people downtown. The one thing I have to say that people will come downtown and go, it's a hidden gem. Well, it shouldn't be a hidden gem. As we grow it, we'll bring our restaurant, will grow uh, with the other restaurants. I heard a lot about pickleball. Um, my generation is a generation that's going towards pickleball. Um, the people that are playing tennis aren't anymore. Um, I have a 14 to nine years old, and that's all they want to play now. So I think as we bring in new families downtown, that's something to consider, that that is a new upcoming growing sport. Um, I appreciate the, the time that they've given. They're completely family-oriented, where I think the historic downtown can grow from that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kenneth Hyatt. Hi, I'm Ken Hyatt, and I've, I've had a shop in downtown Plano for a little over 20 years now, and I'm also a Plano resident. I, I appreciated the fact that the Cravens uh, invited people up to, to listen to their plans. I was very impressed with, with the thoroughness of the plans, and it feels like it is very much in line with the direction that the Plano wants to go. Um, I understand that, that in this area, it's... It's very important to have uh, walkable traffic, and this seems like this is this is something that is very much in line with with what I'm told the city of Plano is is looking forward to have. So I'm I'm very much in favor of this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Cor Corey Reniker. Do we have someone on Zoom? We do. I'll call them next. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Corey Reniker. I'm a uh, 13-year resident of Plano and 11-year homeowner in downtown Plano. I'm an, on the executive board of uh, the Old Town Neighborhood Association, um, although I speak for my, on my behalf, my own behalf this evening. Um, and when I see this presentation and, and what they're planning to bring to this area and this specific site, um, and I'm also an architect, um, this is the sort of density that we need to make the downtown area work. This is sort of active uses that we need. And it just looks like a very high-quality project, and I'd be happy to see it approved. Thank you. Thank you. And finally online, we have Suzanne Ricketts. Is she there? I'll wait for her to pop up. We need you to uh, show your camera. Turn on your camera, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. Yes, we can. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hello, I'm Suzanne Ricketts, and I live uh, in this neighborhood just south of this proposed development. And I'm uh, representing some of the 
resident neighbors here in the neighborhood. Um, currently, we, we discuss among ourselves and um, we are in a small area that's uh, it's growing quite a bit around us. We've got uh, tall walls to our east and tall walls to our west. And pretty soon we'll have more development on the south and this on the north, along with the, the tracks of the Snowboard Bart line and, and the improved traffic as a result of that. Um, some of the things that we wondered have been considered or even can be considered um, are the increasing traffic in this area and the noise from the, the DART station. Is it possible that um, the, the noise of the train itself could be reverberating off of the walls of the high building to the north and coming back at us? Um, I guess those were pretty much our concerns, increased noise and traffic in the area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> is that the last of our speakers? That is the last of the speakers. Okay, at this time then I would ask the commission if they have questions for the applicant. And we got two, three of them. So, um, We'll start with Commissioner Ratliff. Um, I, I think it might be worth asking if your question is for the owner or for Heinz, the developer, or for the outdoor amusement. So you might let them know so they know which. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, my first question is for Sean with Heinz. <clears throat> Sean, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, talk to me about flex units. What, give us your definition of flex units, would you please? Sure. So the flex units will be located on the first floor on the exterior perimeter facing units. And essentially what those are, are units that are designed to accommodate a potential commercial use. So those could be units where an individual lives and also runs a business out of. So, you know, you might, you might envision things like an art gallery or, a private office or, you know, potential, you know, professional services, things like that. You know, there's not rear loading, so it'd be difficult to do something like a restaurant in one of those units. But where we've seen them be successful are some of those kind of service-based uses um, or galleries, maker spaces. You know, you might find someone that, um, you know, runs a business like that that's not necessarily needing like heavy loading and unloading, but uh, needs a storefront and kind of having that street presence is important to them. So explain to me, so as you start to build it out, are you going to market them as residential? Are you going to market them as office? How is that? I don't realize it's a flex space, but um, how, does that, how does that work? Sure. So they would be marketed as typical units, but they would also be on tours. You know, the, the individual would be informed that they could run a business out of it. Um, they could have potentially storefront signage, like on the doors um, and windows potentially. So the idea is we'd like to make that, that streetscape feel activated so it's not just a, a locked door and a gate. You know, it's, it has a potentially an awning and has a feel of, um, of commercial. And if there's a demand for it, it will lease as so. Okay, so I don't know if this question is for you or for Pierce. Is there a reason that there's not something in the PD about flex space? Because I didn't see anything in the PD language. We, we actually, uh, we initially had it in the PD to begin with. Uh, and I believe the last iteration of uh, some red lines from the city had us remove it. We're happy to put that back in as it is our intention. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so a question for Matt from Bolden Acres. And I'm sorry, Matt, I didn't catch your last name. Cart. Cart. Um, what, what is your plan timing-wise? Um, how quickly, how soon are you coming to Plano, Texas? Uh, as soon as we need to, as soon as we can. I mean, we have a number of investors that, like as I mentioned, despite COVID, got their money returned and are eager to invest in more. So um, financially, we're ready to roll. 
Uh, it's just a matter of planning and approval. So is your, is, are you counting on the apartments to be open to feed your business or is yours going to be kind of standalone drawing from the 20 mile radius before even the apartments are open? 390 apartments wouldn't, uh, service what we like to do. So, um, they're definitely part of the business plan, but not the bulk of it. Okay. Ultimately, we'd love to get open way before the apartments if possible and start drawing in the area and then become an amenity for the apartments. Okay. Thank you. So then follow up question for staff is, did we, was there any language about the flex units? Is there a reason we shouldn't have that in the PD? It, it's already allowed for in, in the buildings. It's actually in the, the BG district currently. So flex okay. space is, is it's used by right in the base zone. Correct. Okay. Got it. And it's, it's similar to the type of flex space that you see uh, in Eastside Village 1 and 2, uh, also in the Bel Air. Uh, and as, as Sean indicated, as demand calls for it, they can be allocated toward a more commercial use. There again, as demand. I just want to make sure we were allowing for it. If it's in the base zoning allowed by right, that, that answers my question. So it doesn't, we don't need it in the BD, I guess, is the bottom line. So. Well, I, it, it, I guess it's more a question of intention, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Those are all my questions for right now. Thank you. Commissioner Tom. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's a great project or addition to the city to redevelop some of the um, underused, um, currently uh, zoned properties. Again, I think my concern is about timing, and I think this project's re heavily relying on the uh, development and, and the operation timing of the uh, the rail and the station. And uh, this will be probably the, the first big development around the area or redevelopment around the rail station. So what's your plan if, uh, I know you're, you're proposing to start construction early 2025, and based on our staff's report that the station probably will be in operation uh, end of 2025. What if the station does not complete or does not operate and you're, uh, building is ready to deliver. Um, what's your plan for for people? Where would where would you expect people to come from if the line the silver line is not oper operationing? Well, w I guess one of the things that I would say to that is uh, this would not be the first major project around the Dart Station to begin with. The first was the Faro project, which was three hundred and seventy nine units. Uh, and it was a redevelopment of Plano Marine that was uh, located on the southeast side, southwest side of the track, caddy cornered to our site. So it's, it's the Toll Brothers project. Um, the, the dovetailing of, and Sean can probably speak to this as well, but the dovetailing of the DART schedule is a nice to have, not necessarily a need to have to make this project viable. Further, given the market radius um, that Matt sees with his business there again, it's a nice to have, not a need to have with respect to scheduling and the DART station. But I think what you're going to see as that station comes online, that not only will people take advantage of the station or rather the silver line to travel from perhaps UTD uh, to come visit Matt's business or rather use it as transportation from their dwelling unit to class or what have you. Um, I, I think it becomes additive and not a necessary element to the overall operation and success of this project. Um, which I think, I which I think is a whole... Uh, point of having something that is walkable and complementary to DART, but also to the city of downtown. Okay, well, I do have another question regarding the environment because uh, surrounding this property, there's still a lot of um, older properties and they have not been rezoned. And uh, some industrial properties, they have, they may or may not be redeveloped for a long time, or there's just an unknown, right? So what would you um, propose to um, your future, I guess, tenants or uh, prospects to come to your site when the surrounding areas are in totally different 
I guess, vibe from this property? I think this brings us back to uh, the notion of a catalyst site that was detailed on the AECOM study, which is why this site has the gold star. Because what it will do is it will encourage aggregation of some of the other properties adjacent to this site and encourage redevelopment. For example, when I was when I when I built uh, a townhome project on 17th Street, which I just delivered uh, about three months ago, um, it was interesting to see the neighborhood effects of that project and of that investment. All of a sudden, people were outside of their own homes repainting their facade. And this is the similar type of catalyst effect that I think that you're going to see with the significant investment that Heinz and Bolden Acres will pour into the city of Plano. Thank you. Thank you. I thought that was a reasonable question. Let's just, as we're thinking through our questions, though, for the applicant in particular, let's make sure we're we're focused a little less on operations and more on land use and how this uh, sequencing is a, is a good example. Mr. Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I need a little clarification from the staff to help me to focus my question to the applicant. Mr. Hill, um, the staff is recommending that, as I understand, if a PD is considered, you were asking the applicant to make a commitment to phasing with at least 22,000 square feet of commercial amusement in the first phase. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Also, um, I'm not in the construction business, so could you please educate me in layman's language? What is a horizontal podium and what is its purpose? <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, the, the goal for that requirement in the district was to encourage non-residential space in the first floor to, cr to create activity at that level. And so the design requirement in, in the district, it allows for five stories of building. Four stories of multifamily would be over a first floor, which would be either parking, flex space units, um, or Concrete just... Structure. Right. It says concrete structure, but really the goal is the design of the first floor, that it, it really engage the street. It actually has a minimum floor height of, of nine feet. So it's exterior entrance requirements. So if you look in areas that really engage the street frontage, it has uh, entrances like the applicant was referring to, um, <coughs> accommodation for where you can easily see, hey, these could be commercial or residential spaces and um, something that just provides more activity at the street level rather than just solely residential use. Okay, well, they've already committed to the flex space. Would that satisfy the horizontal podium requirement? It does, it does not, no. What additional commitment would you need to satisfy that? That, that is a specific requirement of the okay. zoning district. Okay. See, I thought it was something structural, like a certain type of foundation. It's, it's a structural. It's a structural situation. The language actually says concrete. That was um, that material is now exempted by the state requirements. Yeah. However, the podium is still in place, and the design features such as entrances, uh, minimum heights, things like that. Those are the elements that would create what we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, either Mr. Hines or Mr. Cravens, whoever can, whoever can best answer the question would be fine. Um, the staff has a concern and has recommended that uh, BG straight zoning could accommodate almost everything that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, what's wrong with going for straight BG zoning? Well, I think one of the things is that the outdoor commercial use is mm -hmm. not applicable within a straight BG zoning, as I understand it, and would require some sort of a waiver. But I believe Frank Turner can speak to more authority on okay. why we requested a PD. Okay. But very briefly, Commissioner, my name is Frank Turner. I'm working with the applicant on the project. Uh, there are several reasons for the plan development designation. Uh, many of the stipulations are simply assurances to the city on the design of the project. They're not entitlement provisions, rather they are uh, assurances that the building will be constructed in certain ways. Uh, however, uh, for outdoor commercial amusement, it does need to be included in a planned development district. It is not mentioned 
uh, either as a use by right or a specific use permit within the BG district. Uh, that's one reason. Number two, uh, we are asking for 390 units under the BG district. The cap <coughs> is 300 units <coughs> per block, not total. You could divide this property into two blocks and have 600 units under BG. Okay. Uh, presuming that it met all the other uh, definitions. Okay. Um, um, but those are among the, yeah. those. Okay, the, the staff has identified four concerns, and I'd like you to speak to each one, starting with 300 units instead of 390. Why not 300? Well, as to the economics, I'll let the developer speak to that. Okay. But there are other projects in the downtown area that exceed 300. Okay, but I'll just touch briefly on that. So the project, in order to be economically viable, needs a higher density than 300 units. So that's the main aspect. We would not just go and propose that if we didn't think the demand was there, right? So the population growth in downtown Plano, specifically within a two mile radius of the site has been significant, over 20% in the last 10 years. And we see that that trend is poised to continue. There's projected to be <coughs> over 1,700 additional people in, in a two mile radius in the next five years. We know the demand is there. Um, if you look at all of the apartments currently in the downtown Plano submarket, um, they're all over 93% occupied today. The most recent one that delivered was the Toll Brothers deal, uh, which leased up in less than 18 months, doing over 20 leases a month. So the demand is there. Um, the density, I think, is needed, as, as you've heard from some of the, the speakers in support. So um, we believe that the 390 units is necessary in order to be viable, and we think it's, um, it is backed by the demand that we're seeing. And I will say that, that there is precedence in that um, recent uh, projects that have been approved exceed 300, as Frank was detailing, I think, somewhere in the nature of 370 to uh, 390 units. Okay. Um, are you willing to commit to a, a horizontal podium construction on One the thing apartment that I building? Will, I'm sorry? on the apartment building. Well, I'll, I'll leave that to Heinz, but w one thing that I too am, like you, Mr. Brunoff, confused mm -hmm. about is what is the difference if we are, if we're committing to flex units and a podium encourages flex units, I, I, I don't quite understand the purpose of a podium. It's prohibitively expensive um, and, and at times can be, can create even more height than we're looking for or proposing. Yeah. But I'll let Sean discuss sure. kind of the semantics there. Yeah, I think the intention of the language about the first floor podium is really about trying to activate the streetscape. And I think the plan we proposed accomplishes that goal. Um, we've designed it with the flex units facing on the exterior on 13th and Municipal, which accomplishes that goal. Like Pierce said, it becomes absorbently expensive to do the concrete level on the entire first floor and it's it's not something that's been done in the downtown Plano area or or in many areas frankly so uh, we believe that we are accomplishing the goal um, of that ask uh, but doing it in a way that's actually economically viable also um, just in terms of uh, the I guess the structural resilience it used to be a requirement to have enough structure to support four stories thereafter. Mm -hmm. However, with further engineering analysis over the course of years, uh, that is no longer needed to support a structure. So sticks can support five stories without a podium. And it just because occurred of the to engineering of glue land beams and, and other building materials that are wood-based. It's no longer required by the building code. It's uh, for it to be a podium separation. It was at the time that BG was written. Yeah. One other comment, while it is a use by right to have flex space in BG, we're willing to add a stipulation that all exterior ground floor units be flex space designed. Um, it seems to me that if you're building 390 
residential units, you are creating a built-in clientele for the proposed restaurant and the amusement, indoor and outdoor amusement areas. That's complimentary. Okay. So why not just go ahead and commit to, commit to, to building the non-residential uses? You've got your clientele right there. It, it, it's a captive clientele. I don't understand the question. I, I get, can you the staff is the asked question? The staff is asking for a commitment to construct 22,000 square feet of, com of commercial development in phase one, which would, which would encompass the restaurant and the um, amusement areas. The numbers are so since you've got a, a, a captive clientele right there in your 390 <clears throat> units, why not just go ahead and commit to it? I think the reason I think the reason that gets difficult is because those will be owned by two separate parties. So the Bolden Acres folks will be purchasing the land for the restaurant and the pickleball. Um, obviously, you've seen Matt speak tonight. He's here. They're ready to go. They are committed to doing this. But in order for those projects to be separate, um, they're capitalized differently. There's different owners um, crossing the two, I guess. Um, inherently becomes difficult for, for the investors in, in, on both sides. So um, we believe those uses are extremely complementary, and we fully intend for both of them to be delivered. So, And I, one thing that I would say, too, is, is many zoning cases come as a speculative venture, mm -hmm. and we are not that. We have our partners here in the flesh today and we're ready to go. And a lot of the uh, construction elements can be complementary, where we may be able to take advantage of some economies of scale, whereby some of the apartment uh, development can occur concurrently with the commercial to save on cost. Well, it's a single combined application, so I'm I'm just saying I would feel I would feel more positively about it if there was a commitment on the non-residential. So I'm just giving and, notice. And okay. I guess one of the things that with, is within our PD is that we are willing to, um, in terms of phasing, you know the language better than I do. Yes, I, I could speak to that briefly. First off, it's important to understand that the infrastructure for the site will be done in its entirety. So we're talking about the vertical aspect of phasing street improvements, water line sewer, clearance of the site, all of those types of things are done in a single action. Then the vertical improvements are conducted following that because fire lanes and other things have to be in place before you can do the vertical. Now as to the number, 5,000 is a somewhat arbitrary number. It could be a different number. Uh, so we're talking in its entirety in between the warehouse building being repurposed mm -hmm. and the new restaurant building, we're somewhere in the order of 20 to 25,000 square feet, and both will be done. However, they may be separate permits. They may be a building permit for the restaurant and a building permit for repurposing the shed. If, if, if you wish a different number in there, a different number could be applied. Um, I think there was another question about phasing um, perhaps let let's okay. do this that's all, yeah, I'm, I'm all right, thank you I think maybe to help under people understand so we have one person that's applying for the zoning it's not the people that are going to build the pickleball courts but they can't speak and guarantee that the investment on that piece of property is going to happen all they can say is we've built a partnership and we hope right but they can't guarantee in their PD that it'll be done because they don't control that. There's a plan for that development, but it isn't something that can be but, legally no, enforced. But the other part let me, here. Let me clarify that we could entertain another PD provision that says, because of concern that there might be a subsequent phase of multifamily, now, of course, Heinz will, their intention is to build 390 units, which uses the entire entitlement. There's no additional units available for a second phase. But if you, would like belt and suspenders, we could say that that only multifamily is permitted on lot one or a certain distance from municipal. Well, you were willing to stipulate the 5,000 square feet. What was that 5,000 square feet going to be? That would probably be the restaurant phase. Well, although, restaurant. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're willing to stipulate the restaurant, just not more. 
We can go with a larger number because okay. yes. 6,000 is the probable size of the restaurant. The industrial building is in excess of 20,000 feet. Okay. But they will probably be two separate permits. But staff's recommendation for 22,000 covers more than the, it, the restaurant and the building covers more than that. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bronski. Uh, so I, I share Mr. Brunoff's concern. Um, I think our staff is, uh, first I want to say thank you. I, this is a great development. I like a lot of uh, what's going on here. Um, and so I, I share Mr. Brunoff's concern about the commitment. If uh, this is... Um, If this pickleball court and the activation of that area is so critical, um, I would like to see it uh, somehow or another tied together so that we can, um, as a commission, be confident that the entire project will be finished. Um, so my first question, I want to ask Matt a question. Um, So we're talking about a commitment to operate 390 apartments. Um, as you're looking at moving, your, as a matter of fact, I checked out your website, very nice, down in Austin. Um, as we're talking about this, the, what I hear from the staff is that all we're seeing is 390 apartments and we don't see a commitment toward the rest of the stuff. Okay, how do you feel as the person looking to go in here, uh, partnered together with Pearson Hines, where they're saying we can't be sure that you're coming? I'm here. Um, I mean, we just opened a new location a week ago. Uh, we've been working nonstop on that. My wife let me come up here this evening to, to speak to y'all on behalf of Bolden Acres, uh, considering how little I've been home. With all that, um, I don't know what other. <laughs> <laughs> Siri. Siri, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I don't. I don't know what more guarantee I can give, um, other than we we've put a lot of time into this. Um, we've been on. We've flown up here multiple times for meetings. Driven up here, obviously. Um, walked the property. We've put money towards architect architectural design. I mean, there's. It's, case yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's, it, there's no small investment on our part uh, to date, um, and that's just not money we, we'd like to see thrown away. Sure. One second. <laughs> Ms. Copeland, uh, is there some way that the, would make the city feel more comfortable with this lack of commitment on the other piece that we could design something to feel a little more comfortable? The staff report indicates that we would like to see a commitment of 22,000 right. so, non-residential space. So the staff believes that the developer can make that commitment? And I think the developer just said that they would make the commitment. Oh, so you are going to make the commitment to the 22,000? The, the square footage would be... The square the, footage of the restaurant far exceeds 22,000. The two buildings combined exceed 22,000, so yes. So does that meet what the staff is talking about in here? That, that's our recommendation, yes. Okay. yes. So you are willing to come back to the recommendation of 22,000? Yes, we could substitute 22,000 for the 5,000 that is mentioned in the write-up. Just, just to be clear, the, our recommendation is for a firm commitment to 22,000. Their commitment is an either or. Either they wait until 2025 or they construct the 5,000. Yes. Now, understand that there are two separate developers on the project, builders of vertical improvements. And one does not want to be saddled by the construction timing of the other. And that's the reason why there is a date provision by which the multifamily could proceed no matter what the situation is for the commercial use. Now, that date was picked as January 1 of 2025. 
if it would make the commission more comfortable, we can extend that by a few months, but you have to understand um, Hines is making a very heavy commitment to building plans and construction and so on, and so they have to have a date cert in which they could proceed. Uh, now, January 1 versus February 1, <laughs> you know, we can, we can talk about it, but there has to be a date certain for the corporation to know that they have a sound investment. Because you have the largest part of the investment in the property held up by a smaller investment. Uh, Matt, if you guys, if this all was approved in the next three months, how long would it take you think, you, you think, to get rolling? If we knew that this was going to be approved, I mean, we'd start probably immediately. Okay. Um, I mean, we could, we can fundraise in a matter of months. Um, our bank's already on board. We've already spoken to them. So. Okay. okay. Uh, and I had one more question for Sean. Um, the flex space on the first floor, if it is being uh, marketed as residential and, hey, by the way, this is available, uh, how does that really activate the street usage? because it's marketed towards people that might want to live in the same place that they conduct their business. So it's catering to folks that a typical apartment unit might not satisfy their needs, right? They, they A, need a ground floor space, which there's not a lot of those, right? Um, and B, they need one that allows them to potentially run their business out of that ground floor space. And so I think, although it will be marketed as residential on tours, you know, it will be explained to the resident, hey, this is, this is what you get. You have a streetscape, you have a front door, you have potential signage opportunities, and that person can then take that opportunity and, and use it to potentially open their business. I think what's interesting too about this, the flex space is to your question is that there's not a lot of opportunities to lease that small of a square footage and, and run a business out of it. You know, to, to go lease a space um, down in city line um, or somewhere else in, in Plano in a, in a typical office building, for one, uh, most landlords may not even entertain you if you're looking for a 1,000 square feet because they might say it's not worth my time and effort, whereas the apartment offers that, that small, flexible option for them. Um, and B, it, it's probably so expensive given where office rates are right now that they may not be able to pay the freight. So I think it offers... It offers a small, flexible option for business owners that they don't need to be on the 10th floor of a, of a high-rise building. They just need a small space where they can conduct their business. So will those, and uh, I may not be familiar exactly with what I'm about to ask, those flex spaces, will they be commercially set up for uh, people with handicaps and more designed universally toward? Um, yes. So the, the entire multifamily building, including the flex units, will be designed for accessibility, so it will adhere to ADA standards um, and, yes, be, be accessible for, for individuals that need that accommodation. So the first floor will be, um, will, accom will the first floor address universal design as a whole? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Law. My question's for Sean as well. There's some artistic renderings in here, and there's been a lot of talk about the downtown area and the uniqueness of the area and, um, you know, all the buzzwords that I'm referring to. The, the rendering looks to me like it's got a lot of brick. And my understanding from staff and state law is we can't tell you how much of these exterior building materials you have to use now. Is there any commitment you can make or is there a typical project mix that you use? I mean, with it being downtown, you look at East Side Village phase one and two, you look at several, you know, Murata, for example, it is a combination of materials, but what, what percentage do you expect to be brick versus? Sure, so <clears throat> we will, through the process of design, go through an extensive benchmarking where we look at what are the comps in the area look like, um, what does their skin composition look like, and what can the project support economically? Our intention is to match those rendering as close as we can. So we want it to be very, very brick heavy. I think Murata is a very, very appealing design. Um, there will be a mix of materials, like you said, 
Um, brick is not the cheapest material, but at the same time, there are ways that we can orient the exterior facing portions of the building to have a heavier mix of those more expensive materials because we want that, that public facing portion to be dressed up, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, the interior courtyards, on the other hand, can have a higher mix of some of the more economically affordable materials. So uh, to answer your question, we intend to do a lot of brick. Um, we intend to have a mix of different colored bricks, and that's something that we will work on with our design team and ensure uh, that we end up with a product that we're very happy with and that complements the downtown area. Thank you. Mr. Ratliff. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, what's, I'm trying to still understand this timing question. So assuming that everything goes forward tonight and with city council, what, what's your timeline without this January 25, if that wasn't on the table, what does the timeline look like for start of construction and initial move in of the first tenant? Sure. So assuming we are approved, we would immediately go into capital raising efforts and then begin the full design of the project as soon as we possibly can. So to date, we've done obviously the concept level design that you all have seen. Um, the next step is to go into what's called schematic design, where we are advancing the site plan and really adding layers of structural engineering, civil engineering, all of the other engineering elements and architectural elements that it takes. So we would go into that immediately. That's typically around a 12 month, give or take process. And when you account for the holidays, that's why to us, the idea was essentially all of 24 is design and then we would be ready to break ground ideally at the start of 2025. So that's where that date came from. Um, the construction timeline to your question is approximately 28 months and you're delivering units just about after the, the 20th month or so. So your first move-ins happen in 2021 um, and you are leasing up as that kind of last seven or eight months of construction concludes. Um, the leasing center and amenities typically deliver first with that first tranche of units so that on tours, you can show the first couple residents, you know, here's the pool, here's the amenity center, here's the dog park, um, the fitness center, things like that, um, that obviously drive tenants to, to lease in the building. So, um, like I said, 12 months, give or take of design, about 28 months of construction thereafter and delivering units in the first, after 20 months. So you're talking about first tenants moving in fall of 26? Yes, sir. Okay. Matt, same question. What's your timeline look like? It's uh, obviously. <laughs> I, yeah, to be completely honest, we're usually held up by the city of Boston. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I mean... uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. I, I work all over the country. This is not Austin. Yeah, on. exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, <laughs> typical design for us is five to six months tops. Um, and we're usually applying during that period. And uh, as soon as designs are approved, we break ground. So a year to build it? You're talking about being open in 18 uh, months or? Overall construction, I'd say we could probably build in a year. Um, I mean, our last project, the city of Boston killed us. So it's really, yeah, it's hard to say, but I could say, yeah, I mean, confidently, I think a year. Unreasonable to think you'd be open by summer of 25. Yeah. Very reasonable. Okay. 18, 18 months from approval to opening, yeah. So you'd be a year ahead of the apart first apartment's turnover? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and they would hopefully send people over to clean up and construction. And hopefully that's part of the tour as well. I mean, that's, our idea would be we are getting potential residents excited to live there because they have this amazing amenity next door. We're going to sell them a lot of gift cards and, and custom paddles <laughs> to give out to their staff. Or their so another follow-up question for Sean as well. The podium requirements in the BG zoning, setting aside the concrete structural element, require flex space units to have an individual exterior entrance and a minimum floor to ceiling separation of nine feet. Um, is that? Yes, that's in line with what we've designed. Okay, so yep. you're meeting all of the criteria. Seeing, yes, yes. Okay, and you're not opposed to restricting or, or putting in the PD that all the units on the ground floor will be flex space. All of the exterior facing exterior units, facing, yes, correct. Absolutely. Okay, and that, so they'll meet all of the criteria of that 
requirement with the exception of the concrete podium? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, oh, Mr. Brunoff. One quick question. I'm, you have to forgive me. I am very bad with names. The gentleman in the pink hat. I'm so sorry. I didn't catch your name. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you said a minute ago that you've spoken with the bank and they're on board. Um, I would think that uh, in order to be assured that you've got financing in place, you'd have to do something more than just speak to the bank. Uh, as uh, we have a very good relationship with their bank. Um, <laughs> we've worked with them for 10 plus years. And again, um, all of our investors and everybody involved have had their money returned pretty quickly. Um, it's a small <laughs> operation based out of Austin, uh, Horizon Bank of Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And they have expressed their excitement in the property and us being the tenants of the property. So that's what I meant when I said the bank was on board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good. So we started this conversation an hour ago. And uh, actually, that may be a record for a multifamily uh, development to have an hour and be done with, uh, with that. So do we have any more speakers? No, we do not. Okay. I am going to close the public hearing, and we will define, confine our discussions here. Um, I, I would have a question uh, for staff uh, first, and that is, I saw the initial design, and it, it showed the street alignment, which tended to be right across from Avenue M, I think it is. Uh, and I can see the benefits of that, but I think we create other issues. Uh, it's unfortunately everywhere I go in the city, there's streets coming in from both sides that always that don't always line up, and that's that's a problem, I guess. So I wish I, I wish I could see that in alignment, but that would shift. My understanding is then if they were doing that, we would almost have to change the sizes of the lots uh, because of the block alignment. And with a larger block two, I think we're more apt to get more apartments because of, of that requirement. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little concerned with that. But I mean, is that really the, the street alignment? How critical is that? I mean, overall to the project? Um, what's been proposed by the applicant, it, it works. Our transportation division is um, acceptable to this. They have a separation requirement when you have a street across from another street. Basically, right. the intersections have to be a certain distance. distance apart. So there's conflicts are not created. They recommended the alignment. They, they thought the traffic pattern would be, um, would be better, better in that situation. Good so point. I think this was, this was a secondary alternative that right. they can live with, right. but their recommendation would be to align. Okay. Um, all right, thank you for that. Um, you know, as a transit-oriented development, we talk about actually those types of developments require density. That's that's what you want. You're a, you know attached almost uh, directly to a, a station. Uh, you can't get much closer than that, and it's it's not that far a walk from downtown. Um, I can see why they would increase the number of units uh, to 390 if they're given, given the opportunity. I, I think the thing that I, I hear people struggling with most is the, the timing and the commitment. And if, if they're willing to commit to the 22,000 feet as fa in the phasing, essentially they're saying that they're agreeing that this development's going to take place with the pickleball and the restaurant. Um, and they did the and or, but uh, I, I kind of tend to be in favor of the use of this property for that type of venue because I'm not sure we have anything like that on the east side of town anywhere that I can think of. So even if it wasn't attached to multifamily, I would be in support of, of that kind of use. Um, so where I come down on this is it's a transit-oriented development in my mind. We're going to have high-density uh, <coughs> development in that area, in that location. And we just have an addition, I think, of, of a uh, potential entertainment venue uh, that's kind of unique and something I certainly would like to see down there. Uh, I've been encouraged for years to play pickleball. I never have. Um, who knows? Maybe they'll drag me out there if they get me a custom paddle. 
uh, he'll give me a gift card. Um, so I, I think in general, yes, I'm in, I'm in favor of the development. Um, I think we'll see more of that um, if the aggregation of the land uses can take place. So I think it's a good use of the property. Uh, in my opinion, I know it doesn't meet all of the requir uh, requirements of the comprehensive plan, but they're willing to move on the <clears throat> flex base and on the phasing of the 22,000 feet. So I'm, I think I'm, I'm good there. And we could push the, the start date back um, a few months. Um, in other words, give uh, Matt more time to get his thing done. Uh, in case, but ultimately, I think both of these are going to get developed and, and hopefully be successful. Mr. Brunoff, you were first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this case does have a couple of things going for it off the bat, which is, first of all, as the applicant pointed out, this is a blighted area and it is in need of redevelopment. Um, it is also uh, taking advantage of our push toward transit-oriented development because of its uh, location adjacent to the DART line and the DART, the 12th Street station and directly across the street. Um, <clears throat> speaking generally, when I, when I see a planned development application for multifamily combined with uh, non-residential uses without a commitment an equal commitment to the non-residential component of the application, um, I start to wonder why is this an application for planned development, okay? Um, I can think of another case that we handled where that was the situation. Um, and if the non-residential use was not built, all we would be left with was a partial development consisting of multifamily. <clears throat> okay. I don't see that here because I see more and um, a stronger commitment and enthusiasm by the, the partner who is going to be taking on the restaurant and the um, amusement area than I saw in the other case with respect to an office building. Uh, the office building was burdened by a depressed market for that type of use, but we don't have that issue here. And we also do not have a noise issue here. Uh, so I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm sold on this project, but I'm willing to say that I'm cautiously optimistic and I'll take a flyer on it. So there you go. Okay. Mr. Ratliff. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as a resident of downtown, I, I have to admit I have mixed emotions because I I appreciate the extra density, but I know it will increase my wait time for a table at Urban Rio on a Friday night, <laughs> <laughs> which will force me over to Fillmore's or someplace like that. Not, not that that's bad. It's all great. Um, no, as uh, seriously, as a, as a resident of downtown, I know that uh, it's, it's thriving, it's growing, and more traffic is, is a great thing. I, I've, I've frequented every one of your establishments more than once, and um, and it's great to see it vibrant and especially busy uh, on the weekends. And I, I wish it was busier on the weekdays. I'm sure you do too. Um, I see this as one of those catalyst projects that will help do that. Uh, I know that that's what the downtown area needs to be um, growing and more vibrant and more opportunity. It needs more places for people to live, both for your customers and for your employees and for other people that are in the area. So. Um, with that, I'm, I'm fully supportive of, of this concept. Um, my wife and I have tried pickleball a couple of times. Uh, let's just say I'm not as nimble as I used to be, um, but maybe with a little more practice and a place close by that I can, that I can find, maybe that's an opportunity for us as well. So um, <clears throat> with those things said, I think that with the two stipulations that the chairman talked about, about the ground floor flex space units and the commitment to the phase one retail, I think those answer the only two concerns I had. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the offset roadway. Uh, I think it's offset far enough that, if anything, it might be a benefit because it will discourage through traffic on what should be a more pedestrian-oriented um, uh, thoroughfare through this complex. Um, I, I would rather not have the through traffic so that it is pedestrian-oriented. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, I think it's a positive to have it offset instead of a negative, in my personal opinion. So. Okay. Um, those are my comments. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Bronski. I, 
I think this uh, development provides us a unique opportunity uh, in Plano. Um, I can appreciate the willingness to go from the 5,000 to the 22,000. Um, I am, uh, I, let me say it like this. Um, after hearing from uh, Matt, uh, as well as Mr. Turner, and uh, the people at Hines and Pierce, uh, I believe that although the staff would like to see a full commitment, I can understand the rationale as to why it can't work as a commitment like they would like to see. Um, and that being said, uh, there are a couple small things that I see here with the comprehensive plan where it doesn't align perfectly. Um, but I believe in total, uh, this is the right use of space for this area. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the middle of 2025 being able to come over and uh, uh, check out your place. Mr. Brunoff. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I forgot to mention uh, one thing. With regard to the 22,000 feet, if it's a commitment to construct 22,000 feet of non-residential use in the first phase, that's one thing, and I would totally support that. But if all they're saying is that they would commit to delay the development of multifamily residential use until the earlier of January 1st, 2025, or after issuing a building permit to construct or repurpose 22,000 square feet of residential space, I would point out it's more difficult to get a building permit for 22,000 feet than for 5,000 feet, and that would actually make the, the commercial less likely. So I think we probably ought to clarify exactly what their undertaking is with respect to the 22,000 feet. So, great question. And also, yeah, I just point out for the applicant's benefit, um, per previous conversation, I happen to know that Councilwoman Hol Holmer is a big supporter of pickleball. So. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is they know that too. Um, all right, so just to be clear, you're, you're saying that by increasing the, the building, the phasing number to 22,000 feet, we perhaps are stumbling on our own feet because getting yeah. the permit for that's more yeah. difficult if, than five. If their undertaking is that they're willing to delay the multifamily construction until the earlier of January 1st, 2025, or after issuing a building permit to construct or repurpose some number of square feet of non-residential oh, space, yeah. then it is to, you know, it would make development, a high number would make development of the, of the commercial space less likely. Yeah, I, I, we might be splitting here. Is there Mr. Ratliff? Well, what I was going to say is there's a big difference between getting a permit and actually constructing and completing. So that's why it doesn't, after hearing what Matt had to say, I, he's going to have his permit probably long before Heinz does. Yeah. is what it sounds like. I mean, so that I understand your concern, but I think that that shows their commitment to the project, and, I, and that's what I was looking for. So. Okay. Mr. Uh, I just wanted to clarify our recommendation to the 22,000. That's approximately the size of that warehouse building that they're proposing to utilize and preserve. So it would be for that building, would not necessarily include the adjacent restaurant building. So if you made it for 5,000, now you're ensuring to build a restaurant, but maybe don't do the, the warehouse. <laughs> so again, do we want to, are we going to shoot ourselves? To me, I don't think that he's going to build a warehouse unless he's building the restaurant. And he's not going to build the restaurant unless he's building the warehouse. I, I think we're going to get the package. Mr. Lyle, you have a comment? <laughs> like yeah, I understand. You can apply for permits. Okay. I mean, let, let, let's let the people bring the project. Okay, well, Mr. So, Bronski. I move that we approve this uh, as submitted. Wait, is that the subject point? to the subject? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let's be careful with our motion. <laughs> well, because it's sub to this. Yeah, that, that was what we talked about. Yeah. Go ahead. Why don't you let Mr. Rattles make the motion? Go ahead. You're I'll really second. Good, you're really good at second. <laughs> yeah. 
can, can, uh, you, Go ahead. can I have a floor? I'll, yeah. I'll pass the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve as submitted with the conditions that all exterior ground floor units will be flex space design with a minimum of nine foot ceiling heights and individual exterior entrances and that we will have a 22, minimum 22,000 square foot phase one commercial use building permit issued prior to the issuance of the building permit for the multifamily in phase two. So I have one question related to that. Was it a, just an entrance or was it an entrance and an exit? All the, all the BG both. says is entrance. Entrance. Okay. You can walk in and out that door. Is that right? You can go in and go out that door. Okay. So I'll, if Mr. that's Hill. the case, then. Well, I just want to clarify, that's not the recommendation, that's not the request. You're, you're, you're oh, recommending that they do the a permit before they get a permit for the multifamily, or are you requesting to increase the 5,000 to 22,000 but keep the timed restriction proposal? Good point. Let me clarify that. I am I'm <laughs> clarifying that the 5,000 recommendation has changed to 22,000 um, and the timing of the multifamily construction. Is everybody pretty clear? I mean, we've had clear as mud. a lot of discussion around it. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I want us to be clear. I don't think that I'm clear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perhaps Mr. Yeah. Hill could articulate what the motion might be, and then we could... I, I was going to say, second, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can, I hope. <laughs> because what we're, essentially what we're doing is we're creating what was removed from the PD language was the flex base piece, right? So the, the recommendation is to... I'm not going to ignore it is to include uh, one that the ground floor be designed with the flex space requirements of the BG district, mm -hmm. which would be exterior entrances are required and a nine minimum floor to ceiling separation of nine feet. So that, that's one, the horizontal podium is not included in that recommendation, correct? Right. So secondly, that the timed standard for phasing, instead of being 5,000 square feet, be increased to 22,000. So the the project could move forward either with a January 1st, 2025 vertical construction for the multifamily or the earlier of the 22,000 commercial. I think I butchered that last part, but does that... The permit for the 22,000. The permit could move forward. I can read that language to you all just to confirm. I think the key part here is that, again, before we vote, everyone needs to be kind of clear that we're... we're, we're we're slightly, in my opinion, slightly modifying staff's recommendation. And it's really just going back to the PD and adding the flex space requirements, which were already there, but we just got changed, yeah. and moving the 5,000 feet to 22,000 feet. That's correct. really, that's, that's all we're doing. That's, that's correct. what I thought. Right. It's a building permit for a date. For a date. So that's correct. The language right. correct. is vertical residential construction may not occur until the earlier of January 1st, 2025, or after the issuance of a building permit for the construction or repurposing of 22,000 square feet of non-residential space. Right. Correct. So that, is that clear? Is everyone clear? That's what I thought I said. But that's that's what you thought you said? <laughs> All I right. second the motion. I'm going to, okay, so we have a second. Uh, I'm going to ask our attorney, are you comfortable with the motion and the language? Yeah, I think it's clear now. Okay, very good. All right, so with that, we're going to vote on item 2A. Please vote. And that carries 6-0. Wow, a lot of discussion. Uh, this will require findings, and I think we need to do that before we go to item 2B for the vote on that, correct? Yes. Okay. So we're still in session, but we're going to have to do some paperwork so you guys can relax for a couple of minutes.
Okay, uh, we've completed our uh, side business thing that we had to do with the findings forms, and we're going to move on to item 2B. I need a motion for 2B. I move we approve 2B. Wait, stop. Oh. Hang on a second. I'm sorry. That's fine. I thought we went for the presentation for both. That, that you're right. Just just to clarify, our recommendation would be subject to uh, council approval of the zoning case. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I move we approve to be subject to council's action uh, on the zoning case. Twenty twenty three dash zero one three. So a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Ratliff to approve item B to B. Excuse me. Subject to council approval of the zoning case uh, change. Please vote. Okay, and that item carries 6 0. Item 3. Agenda item number 3 public hearing zoning case 2023 017. Request for a specific use permit for private club on point one acre located 444 feet west of the Dallas North Tollway and 1,398 feet north of Park Boulevard, zoned regional commercial and located within the Dallas North Tollway overlay district. Petitioner is Centennial Waterfall Willow Bend, LLC. This is for legislative consideration. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm Raha Puladi, lead planner with the planning department. Yeah, um, they're moving out slowly. Sure. working out all right thank you go ahead sure this request is for a specific use permit for a private club within the shops at willow bend regional shopping mall private clubs require sup to operate within regional commercial zoning district the proposed uh, the subject property is outlined in yellow and is located in the interior of the existing shopping mall the surrounding area is a, uh, additional mall property, zone regional commercial, and developed with retail and restaurant. The proposed request has been reviewed for um, conformance with the comprehensive plan, and the conformity to the uh, applicable criteria are reflected in the next two slides. Why is it still out? As was mentioned in the um, staff report, there are four SUPs for private clubs within the proximity to the subject's property. The existing private SUP for private clubs are highlighted in yellow. We have not received any responses for this zoning case. This request meets the zoning requirement for the setbacks and also is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. As a result, staff recommends approval of the uh, SUP request subject to the property owner maintaining receipts and records to ensure compliance with the minimum sale of food requirements in section 15.1000.2C of the zoning ordinance. At this point, my presentation concludes and I'm happy to answer any question and the Thank applicant is available if you have any specific questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Uh, go ahead. So uh, one small question. Um, is this uh, a part of the greater development or redevelopment they're doing over there, or is this standalone? Currently, this SUP petition is a standalone, but it is in conformance with what they are proposing as part of that uh, zoning case, which is zoning case 2023-005. So they're not in conflict. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure. Sure. Uh, my only question for staff would be whether or not the, a motion needs to include all the language around subject to them maintaining receipts. Isn't that required by law already? Or do we need to put that in our motion? It, it, it is required in the ordinance. I think there was um, some discussion we had with the applicant about how, how to do that. And so just for perfect clarity, we wanted okay. to include it in the motion. All right, very good, uh, absolutely. Okay, any other questions for staff? All right, seeing none, thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on it? No, we do not. All right, thank you. I'll close the public hearing. Find discussion of the commission. 
Mr. Rowe. Make a motion we approve uh, this item subject to the property owner maintaining records and receipts to ensure compliance with the minimum sale of food requirements in section 15.100.2C, sorry, 15.1000.2C of the zoning ordinance. Second. So I have a thorough motion by Mr. Ratliff with a second by Commissioner Bronski on item three, please vote. That item carries six zero. Item four. Agenda item number four, public hearing zoning case 2023-018. Request to amend plan development 37 retail neighborhood office on 7.8 acres located on the north side of 14th Street, 808 feet east of Rios, Los Rios Boulevard. This was tabled on September 5th, 2023. Petitioner is 4301 Development <coughs> LP. This is for legislative consideration. Good evening, commissioners. My name is John Kim, the planner for the plan planning department. Uh, here, the applicant has requested to table the zoning case to the October 16th, 2023 meeting. And the staff recommends that the planning commission accept the applicant's request. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? Thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. All right, thank you. I'll close the public hearing. Can find discussion of the commission. So oh, I did have a question. Oh, uh, I, I was just curious. Uh, what was the reason for the uh, needing to be tabled? I'm, I'm happy to provide context on that. We're, we're still working with their uh, engineer, uh, making sure that the plan uh, just finishes out some of the comments that we had. So it's just taking this some additional time with some of the projects they have. So okay. that was all. Uh, okay. So I, I move uh, <laughs> that uh, we accept the applicant's request to table zoning case 2023-018 to the October 16th, 2023 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Second. Thank you. I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Lyle to uh, approve the tabling request. Please vote. And that item carries 6-0. Item 5. Agenda item number five, public hearing, replat and revised site plan. One patio home lot on 0.1 acre located on the east side of Shattuck Boulevard, 217 feet north of Turtle Creek Drive. Zone plan development, 423 patio home. Applicant is Paul N. and Julia S. Horn. This is for administrative consideration. Thank you. Staff recommends approval of the replat and the revised site plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Any questions for staff on this item, Mr. Rallis? I just have one really quick kind of generic question. This is like the third or fourth case we've had in this subdivision. Is it just the houses aren't quite fitting on the lots like they thought, or is there some bigger problem? Um, they are uh, proposing a unique uh, setback for um, these patio home lots, and um, the ordinance allows for it. The applicant is, um, instead of submitting one revised site plan um, to uh, change all those setbacks, they are doing it one by one, and actually you're going to see more of this development in the future. Okay, just curious, thank you. Sure. Is this something that the new state law is gonna allow us to get passed? That's what our hope is, yes. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'll open the public hearing, any speakers on this item? No, we do not. All right, thank you, I'll close the public hearing. I move we approve this as submitted. Thank you. Yes. Agenda item five. Okay. All right, so I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Brunoff to approve item five as submitted. Please vote. That item carries six to zero. Item six. Agenda item number six, public hearing replat. CRUMC edition, block one, lot 1R. 363 multifamily residence units on one lot on 16.9 acres located at the southeast corner of Custer Road and Legacy Drive. Zoned multifamily residence three. 
Applicant is HS slash P Legacy Square LLC. This is for administrative consideration. The staff recommends this replat for approval as submitted. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? All right. Thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? No, we do not. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing. Anybody awake? Go for it, Mr. Law. So I have a motion by Commissioner Lyle with a second by Commissioner Brunoff to approve item six as submitted. Please vote. That item carries 6 0. Now we get into the meat. Non public hearing items. Legislative stuff. The presiding officer will permit limited public comment on items of the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure me meeting efficiency, it may not include a total time limit. Item number seven is discussion and direction, HB 3699 plat changes. Discussion and direction regarding changes to state law through House Bill 3699 for the approval authority of plats. Applicant is City of Plano. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening. I'm Melissa Kleinick, lead planner with the planning department. The 88th Texas Legislature passed House Bill 3699, which includes fairly extensive updates to city subdivision requirements, as well as changes to Chapter 212 of the Local Government Code. This discussion is focused on a change to Chapter 212, which allows staff to approve plats that would previously have been approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission if the Commission or City Council chooses to delegate the authority. With the changes made via Subdivision Ordinance Amendment 2023-002, approved by City Council on August 28th, operations are compliant today with HB 3699. This is an additional allowance that we are considering. The Chapter 212 of Local Government Code assigns plat approval authority to the Municipal Planning Commission. However, the Commission may delegate this authority to one or more officers or employees of the municipality. Prior to the changes made through HB 3699, approval authority could only be delegated to staff for certain plat types, including amending plats and minor plats. Certain replats could also be approved by staff. However, for single and two family residential replats, Chapter 212 requires notification, and if these replats require a variance, a public hearing must be held. The city has therefore historically opted to notice all single and two family residential replats and to schedule all replats for public hearings. The breakdown of plat approval authority under this current practice is shown here. Staff is proposing the commission delegate the approval authority to staff for most plat types. The breakdown of plat approval under the proposed practice is shown here. Plat approval is an administrative procedure, so a plat may only be denied if it does not comply with city regulations and reasons are provided for the denial. Further, time to obtain project approvals is an extremely critical and costly consideration for development projects. Plats may be ready for consideration one to one and a half weeks prior to a commission meeting, impacting an applicant's timeline. Placing plats on the agenda can create confusion for the applicant and for the public. Please note residential replats must remain on agendas as the state still requires notification, which you'll see in the breakdown here. To summarize, benefits of the proposed practice include a streamlined development process, allowing plats to be approved sooner, a reduction in the number of items for review on the commission agendas, allowing the commission to focus on substantive legislative items, and an increase in administrative efficiency. Under the current practice, the commission approved 128 plats within a one year period while staff approved zero. And the breakdown is shown on the screen. Under the proposed practice, using those same one-year numbers, the commission would have approved 17 plats, while staff would review and approve 111. This would be an 87% reduction in plats seen by the commission. 
At this time, staff is requesting the commission provide direction on the proposed plot approval authority changes. If the commission's direction is to delegate approval authority to staff for some plots, amendments to the subdivision ordinance will be drafted and incorporated into subdivision ordinance amendment 2023-003 for consideration by the commission and the council. And I can answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ratliff. I just want to make it clear because you covered it, but I just want to make it clear for the, anybody that's watching or listening and doesn't understand all this, that right now, if you all say it is administratively complete and technically accurate as a, as a P and Z, we have to find a mistake in your work in order to not approve it. Correct. Mm, correct. Or something it doesn't comply with in our opinion versus what you've recommended to us. Has there been a case where that has happened? Not to my knowledge, Mr. Hill. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I will not say that our staff is perfect, although we, we do try very hard. So there may have been one or two here or there over the years that may have need to come back before you. But in, in general, um, very rare, very rarely. I, I cannot think of it, an example offhand, but I've been here 20 years, so it's possible. Well, I, I know it's, it's hard to do absolutes, and I, I respect that. My, I guess my point is that the administrative approval process is ceremonial at best. And uh, I think that covers 99% of the situations. Right. So we're not really changing much other than we're speeding up the process for those people that are trying to do something in the city of Plano. That's correct. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me say <clears throat> I think we have an outstanding staff. And we're all very appreciative of the work that they do, the support that they give to us, to the council, and, and to the people of the city. Having said that, however, I strongly feel that this city belongs to the citizens and not to developers and not, and not to the staff, and that the people of Plano have a stake in the, the overall development of the city. They have a right to have a voice. They have a right for their government to be transparent so they can see what is going on and in appropriate cases to have the opportunity for input to address the commission or the council as the case may be and to have their, their voices heard. This proposal, I think, disenfranchises the people generally and removes from them the opportunity to have meaningful input on the way that the development of the city is planned and proceeds. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, the council does not see plats. The plats generally are handled at the Planning and Zoning Commission level, and therefore, we as commissioners are the representatives of, of the people with respect to the plat approval process. I think we should continue to assume that role and that there should be no changes uh, in the present procedure. We should continue to receive all the plats uh, <clears throat> uh, that we have <clears throat> excuse me, received, you know, that, that we've um, had to approve up to this point. I think the 30-day shot clock is not a long delay. I don't think it materially disadvantages applicants. <clears throat> I don't think it um, impedes development in any way. I don't think 30 days is very much. I would be opposed to delegating our approval authority to the staff for the reasons that I just stated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law. One of the things you said is it creates an illusion for the public by putting it on a public agenda. I think that's what you said because it, create, it creates this illusion that one of us can actually do something about it. And so we put it on an agenda, we invite people down here to speak on it, but we have no power to approve it if it's met the requirements to disapprove it. Disapprove well, yeah, I'm sorry. We have or deny. We have a responsibility to approve it That's if it's right. met the legal requirements. And so while I agree with your sentiment, it's really this false transparency because it creates an illusion that something can be done. And if, if they've met the legal requirement and staff says they've met the legal requirement, then by law it passes. So I don't, I don't think we achieve the objectives that your sentiment outlined. And I would be in support of delegating this to staff okay. to let them do what they've been doing all along, which is 
checking. And I do have a question, though. Let's say that staff misses something on a plat and approves it, and then there's a, a mistake found. Is there any? What happens? What happens? <clears throat> Uh, in, in that instance, in the plot gets recorded, it is a recorded document. Um, if there is an error, then we would typically try to address that with the applicant if it's discovered. You know, we, the way that we handle that is, hey, we've, we've noticed this is a situation. This is incorrect. We would like you to bring it back. So we kind of ask politely. Um, th there is, uh, when you, it's a little bit, a little bit tricky to discuss that. Um, it's so rare that I think that happens, um, but periodically there are problems in a plant and typically the property owner and developer wants to make sure they meet the, the letter of the law, so typically they'll fix that issue. If there's an issue where there's a conflict and it impacts their development, then we'll work through options for them. Perhaps they need to seek a variance at that point um, and come before you for the variant situation that we've discussed before. Um, or pursue other other means of rectification. So generally, if there's an error, we, we're able to work with the applicant and correct it, and we they can do a correcting plat. Um, there's a, an amending plat that's allowed in the subdivision ordinance, so that can fix any errors that, that do occur. So, And it, if you were to simply explain what a plat does, I'm going to try. Sure. A plat takes a piece of property and subdivides it into lots? Correct. It, it creates the boundaries of a property and it establishes any uh, necessary easements for utilities, such as a water line. Um, it also sets areas for um, streets through the dedication of right of way. So that's that's the purpose. It's to subdivide and to develop a property. Right. And if the technical standards are met, we have to approve it. Correct. Commissioner Tony. So I actually have a um, concern from a different angle. The, it's not regarding whether we have the authority or not have an authority. I think I feel guilty of myself that I didn't quite understand our role of being this authority to approve or not approve a plat. Maybe this is something we can talk about. What are you expecting us to do if we have the authority, if when we have the authority approved? I know a few of our commissioners said that we are supposed to point out the mistakes, but is it possibility, and I can see scenarios that maybe we are reviewing the plats um, in the commission, but the easement, the water, or the utility may have an impact to the neighboring properties or the neighbors that we may or may not have thought of, and the, the, the public may recognize that, given that maybe in the past 20 years it never happened, but could it be something that we should consider in the future? Because that will give the uh, public uh, a time or a chance to review what's happening in their um, adjacent property that's about to be developed, and there might be a you know utility easement that goes through their backyard or something new to their surroundings they you know they need to know sure. so when an impact would occur such as an easement that's needed in a property or or other situation that affects a plot, that situation is brought about through working with the property owner or adjacent neighbors. There are instances where an off-site easement is required. Say you need a utility from your neighbor, you need a water line that serves your property. Right. The developer would work with that adjacent property owner and there's an easement that they would gain from them uh, so that they could have access to that utility. So I, I can't think of a situation where we, we would approve a plat and it would impact a property owner without their knowledge. Um, you know, the, the question really is, I, th I think as Commissioner Brunoff rightly pointed out, is, is the transparency. You know, your agendas are posted and they're public, they're transparent. Staff does post our lists of development on the website. Um, we do have a map which maps all the properties that have development that are ongoing. Um, we're actually actively working on a new project tracking system so that people can even look up the plans and you can see those um, as you click on a particular property. So there, I think there is additional transparency with us bringing them forward um, for you for consideration. But as you can see, our proposals, 
proposal is in line with you know what Mr. Lyle's addressing is that there's really nothing for the there's nothing for you to review specifically unless you really dig into the details. You'd have to understand the subdivision ordinance. You'd have to look at how the, the lot is laid out, the building setbacks. And so from time to time, we do have commissioners that are knowledgeable. Typically it's an engineer um, and they will give us questions on easements and, and things like that. And there's dedication language that Michelle does a fantastic job working with us on. So unless you are kind of really in the weeds and, and technically experienced, it's kind of hard for you to review it, especially with the um, amount of material we give you to review. Um, so I think the challenges that we have maintaining this are just the, the sheer numbers that we have before you and then the you know, ability for you all to um, review those from an experienced perspective. We would be glad to give you some more training if, if you would like to keep them and um, give you some things to look out for that, that, that we do review. Um, I, I don't see this as a major issue from a transparency perspective. We rarely get questions on plats uh, from the public unless it is a specific development that they're interested in. We had a lot of questions on a church expansion that they developed a chapel. You all may remember that a, a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. But again, that was a request that was allowed. And so they came out with an expectation that we would change some things and we just kind of reassured them that you're meeting the requirements, the church is meeting the requirements. And so there wasn't much we could do. Um, and I think our goal is really to just give you and the staff some efficiencies and also improve it for the applicants. The number one issue we have with developers is timing and time is money to them. And so if we can um, make, a, make a development practice in the city more efficient, approve projects um, faster, and if they still have the, the same quality level review that's given by our development staff, I think that's a good recommendation. Um, but again, we'll take direction from you all if you think that's a supportable idea. Thank so. you. I see more people have questions, but um, from a transparency standpoint, um, I, I tend to agree a little bit more with Mr. Lyle in that, you know, it can be clear as a bell, but I don't care if there's 300 people in here that are opposed to it, if it meets the requirement. Um, is it possible, and, and I guess the question is, is transparency defined as it's on our agenda and the documents are there? If so, um, is there anything preventing us from approving all plat requirements in one motion as part of the consent agenda? Is there anything to present, prevent that? Yes, there are some um, replat requirements for certain residential cases, um, and that's what's in your in your. This staff would report, still correct. be required by us anyway. That's but correct. Anything else that fell underneath there? In the plats approved by staff um, section, and, and this client, if you could go to that slide, that's the proposed. Um, yes, there. this one here. So the plats approved by staff, conveyance plat, preliminary. Um, Final plat, replat, amended plat. Th those items, those are typically they have no conditions. Their state law already requires mm -hmm. traditional commercial replats um, to be approved in this manner. Mm -hmm. But when you get to a residential replat, those have specific notice requirements and conditions, and then variances, of course, would be at of your course. discretion. So those would be the the plats approved by PNZ would remain as individual items on the on the agenda. All the remaining, and right now, correct me if I'm wrong, but an amended plat and minor plat are already approved by staff. Correct. And that, that's a small number, but they're already approved. All the other ones that are on there that we're currently doing as an individual line item on our agenda, is it possible to consolidate those? And we approve all the plats at once because now they've hit the agenda. Um, now, that doesn't meet the issue that the developer has with this is a delay, right? Because now... It's got to hit our agenda. It's got to be posted. They've got to wait for us to hear it. It could be two weeks or, you know, however long it is. And so in the end, is that a worthwhile delay based on the amount of questions you get, the number of times we have anybody here to act? Well, here we are. We're talking about plats and whether they should be approved or not. There's not a single person sitting in this auditorium to, to hear this discussion, right? So I, I don't want us to pull this apart too far because I think that what's remaining for us to approve are the ones that are going to make the most, have the most probably input and the most impact. The remind, the remainder, I'm more interested in benefiting 
the flow of business and uh, work in, in the city. So I, I, all, everybody's boards are lit up, but I think we, let's just be, let's not beat a dead horse here because I can understand the transparency, but if we're not, if there's not a huge issue with it, I don't want to create an issue that doesn't really exist. So let's go, Mr. Bronski. So my, my first question is, are there a lot of other cities doing this? What is the, the outcome of this process? Is this clinic, have we reviewed other cities yet? I think that's typically part of our procedures, but I'm not sure if we've done that yet. Right, we have not for the purposes of this discussion. Um, I am not sure if other cities have made this change yet with the bill just being approved, but it would be something we would look into if we bring forward the um, text amendment. Okay, and the ability to approve the plats approved by staff, would that be able to be done on the consent agenda? No, so if it's approved by staff, then you would not see those items no, on no, your no. agenda. My question is, oh. the items listed it under Plats approved by staff. Except for the preliminary replat and the replat, those we have as public hearing items. Everything else, conveyance, preliminary plat, and final plat are consent items. Okay, so the two that require public hearings, what would be the process if we moved it to having staff do it for the public to have input as they would in a public hearing uh, with staff on this? So it would be, there would be no required um, hearing, hearing in that situation. So just like the other plats, if they had questions, they, they could address it with us. We could schedule a meeting with them. It, it would just be a typical development conversation at that point. So there, but, okay. Um, I know we had uh, something a few years back uh, with some concerns about commissioners not necessarily agreeing with the way a couple plat, uh, a plat was read and what their opinion was on how the city approved it or it, whether it was wrong or not. Um, I can certainly understand Mr. Brunoff's position. I do believe very strongly the idea of transparency and I think um, the two items that require public hearing um, have been done that way on purpose to allow that public input uh, for that. I would feel a lot more comfortable approving this uh, if I knew that this was something that was, in, that was common and that was uh, a, a typical practice as opposed to being the very first one out the gate and be the one that has to finally discover whether this was a good idea or not. Yeah, we can do some research and bring that. If you are supportive of us considering this, uh, then we can bring back that research with the uh, amendment that we'll bring to you. And I think you bring up a good point here, which is our purpose tonight is just to tell staff, look, go figure these kinds of things out because we're going to have another dialogue around this. So again, another re I'm, we're not trying to make a decision tonight. We're trying to give staff some guidance on, hey, yes, general, maybe we're we're kind of in favor of it, maybe not all of us, but in general, we'd like more information so that we can give them, you know, some kind of make make a decision. So, um, I get Mr. Brunoff, you. Um, whether there are 300 people out there, 50 people out there, or two people out there, if we have a plat in front of us that's an administrative consideration, we have to approve it. I want them to see us do it. I don't want the people to be suspicious that their government is going on behind closed doors upstairs, uh, you know, at, uh, behind elevators that they can't get on and that they don't know anything about by people that they think don't have their interest at heart. Every time we have an apartment case, half the population out there thinks we don't have their interest at heart. Okay? Another point I'd like to bring out is that by approving all of these plats, we obtain knowledge as to what is going on in the city in terms of development. We acquire context so that when a case comes before us that we do have to exercise some discretion on as to whether to approve or not, we know what is going on in the neighborhood, 
in the surrounding area, in the city in general, and that can help guide our decisions. I know when I get an agenda, even if it's there's a long list of items for administrative consideration I get in my car and I drive around and I drive by every one of them just to see where they are and what the, what the immediate neighborhood looks like. And that informs me as to what's going on in the city. I know full well we're going to approve them. That's not the point. The point is I want to know what's happening because it makes me be a better commissioner. Okay? And I think it benefits all of us to have that authority so that we gain that knowledge. Thank you. Mr. Ratliff. Um, yeah, just provide input to staff, kind of echoing Mr. Bronski's point. I think I think we have to look at on this list of the plats approved by staff. I'd like to break out the two that would have required the public hearings, just to have a separate discussion over those two items. Mm -hmm. And then something else I'd like y'all to explore is would there be a staff reporting mechanism? Because I'm I kind of agree with Mr. Brunoff as well. I'd like to know what's going on. I don't think we necessarily have to vote on it, but could we get a staff report of these are the plats we approved last month or just some F, just a heads up, this is what's going on so that we can kind of keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on. Is that a something we can explore as well as part of this process? Yes, we could produce a report of any plats approved to include within your packet. I and I would like to clarify that only residential replots, the single family and two family, as well as plots requiring a variance require a public hearing. Um, per state law, currently, our practice is just going above and beyond that. Okay, well, that helps me, yeah. Right. So, yeah, but I think uh, something to consider is, you know, maybe we get a, because that might solve the transparency as well, a staff report of these are all the plats that were approved at the staff level, and just as it's in our packet, it's public knowledge, and, and if somebody wants to come talk about it, they can come talk about it. That might it's be a reasonable good. suggestion, because it doesn't hold up the approval of these things, so that developments aren't held up or, you know, whatever's trying to happen. Yeah. Mr. Law. I remember early, like one of my first meetings, there were maybe 32 single family lots getting platted in the UMU district over at Heritage Creek site. <clears throat> it had all the lots, it had the streets. If, if someone in the surrounding community across maybe north of Plano Parkway called staff and said, had questions about that, what would y'all do today? If, it, if they had questions about a project that was on the agenda versus not on the agenda, is that the well, question? Well, I mean, if, if there's really someone that's concerned about what's happening across sure. the street from them and they called and asked about it, I'm thinking you would have the conversation with them. And if it was, I mean, in today's scenario, it's gonna go on agenda. Mm -hmm. So you're probably gonna tell them, hey, that's gonna be heard before planning and zoning at this particular time. Yeah, it depends on the request, right? So, and there are even situations like in that example for an urban mixed use district, you all would see a preliminary site plan, which that's, that's not part of this consideration, but a final site plan is approved by staff, right? So if that were the situation, you know, this, the plat would be at the staff level, but they would see a plan, which I think is more representative of the project because mm -hmm. it shows the buildings, shows the improvements. And that's really, I think what the public is mainly looking towards is what's the development gonna look like? Whereas the plat doesn't really represent that unless you can read what those lines mean. So typically if someone asks questions, we'll send them the plan or plat in question. And we would say, this is under review or staff is considering it for near-term approval or it's going to the commission on this date. So you're correct. Um, but yes, it would then, once it's finalized, be placed on an agenda or under the current practice. Um, otherwise, we would just send them the versions that they'd asked for them until it was ready to be approved. And, and I'm coming at this from the angle that if someone's really paying attention and they have a concern, mm -hmm. I feel like they can reach out to you guys and our staff that we've already talked about their greatness is going to kind of talk through them and ask those questions and be transparent with them. And I can, if I put myself in those shoes and I call and I talk to staff and staff says, Hey, this is going to go on an agenda for approval. That kind of gives me some hope that I'm going to have some voice and then to get here and have it administratively approved anyway. And I came all the way down here and I thought that it, that it mattered that I concern, had concerns, and it really doesn't matter because it has to pass. I feel like the person that has those concerns is better off talking with staff than 
having some false hope of showing up here. So it sounds like direction to staff is uh, cautious, maybe. They show up here, they get nowhere. Recommendation to kind of move this direction, but mm -mm. I like Commissioner Ratliff's idea of perhaps a report. The assumption here is that they Because now the you've got transparency and we've got information. Or if there is, they um, but it doesn't delay the, the progress. Um, I'm assuming as part of your normal day-to-day -day activities, preparing a report around all of this plat stuff that happens anyway, you would just consolidate it into our agenda as a report. Yeah, we'd be glad to do that. And Ms. Pilati brought up a good point to me and, and it's a message, but our Heritage Commission receives staff approved certificates of, author of appropriateness, excuse me, mm -hmm. and at their meetings, we do provide a report to them on what was approved and just to give them, hey, this oh, is yeah. what we've done so outside be the same of, way. correct, that's a possibility. Okay, so we don't have to take action. We were just giving you guys some guidance. Um, I, I appreciate Mr. Bronsky's point about, you know, are we the tip of the spear here on doing this or no, this is something that is more common in other locations. Uh, and Mr. Brunoff, I applaud everything that you said. It makes great sense. I understand it. Um, and you're always very eloquent, so thank you for that. Okay, anything else? 9.35, we are adjourned. Thank you.